Frequency distribution. When you're working with a large data set, a frequency distribution or a frequency distribution table is often helpful in organizing and summarizing data. A frequency distribution helps us to understand the nature of the distribution of the data set. So when we talk about a frequency distribution and a table, the table shows classes or intervals of the data with a count of the number of entries in each class. The first number in each class is the lower limit or the lower class limit. The second number in the class or interval is called the upper class limit. The distance between the two lower classes is called the class width. And in this case, case the class width is 5. 6 minus 1 is 5. And the class width will be consistent through each level of interval. So between 6 and 11, the class width is 5, and so on. So the class width is consistent throughout the entire frequency distribution table. And the frequency, abbreviated with a italicized F, is the number of data entries that fell in that interval. So when you have data and you are doing a table, a frequency distribution table, you're going to need classes or intervals, and then what you're going to do from that data set is you're going to count how many data pieces fall within that interval. So when you're constructing a frequency distribution, the first thing you're going to do is decide the number of classes that you're going to use. And usually it's going to be between 5 and 20. Now in this case, we're going to be usually given it. To find the class width, and remember that class width is the difference between the first interval and the second interval, and the second interval to the third interview. That class width is consistent through the entire frequency distribution table. So to find that class width, you're going to need the max value from the data set minus the min value from the data set. And then what you're going to do is you're going to divide it by the number of classes you're going to use. Now in this case, you always have to round up to the, the next whole number. So even if there's a decimal that normally would not round up, you would still round it up because you want to make sure that the intervals are correctly spaced. So always round up. So let's do an example. The following sample data set lists the prices in dollars of 30 portable global positioning systems, or GPSs. We want to construct a frequency distribution that has seven classes. So the number of classes in this case is given. It wants us to have seven classes. Now we want to find our class width. In order to find the class width, you have to have the number of classes you're going to use. And then we're going to find the max value in the data set and the min value in the data set. So when you look through this data set, you're going to find that our max value is 450 and the min value is 59. So you're going to get the difference between 450 and 59, and you see that it's 391. Then what you're going to do is you're going to divide it by the number of classes we want, and in this case it's 7, and we end up with the class width is 55.86. Now it always has to be a whole number, so you're going to round this up and it's going to be 56 will be our class width. Once you have the class width, then you're going to find the class limits. So you need to find the class limits. You're always going to start with the smallest data entry. So smart with, start with the smallest data entry, and that's going to be the lower limit of your first class or first interval. To find the remaining lower limits, you're going to add that class width to the lower limits of the preceding class. 
And you're going to do that until you get, in the, in the example case, seven classes or whatever number of classes they're asking you to use. Then you can find your upper limits of the first class. And note, the classes cannot overlap. So you can't have an upper limit value that is the same as the lower limit value for the next interval. They cannot overlap. To find the remaining upper class limits, you can use the class width to find the remaining upper class limits. So here we go. So we're going to find the class limits. Again, we're going to start with the smallest data entry, and it's the same example. So our smallest data entry is 59, and we found our class width to be 56. So now we're going to take the lower class limit of 59 and add 56. And we're going to add 56 all the way to down until we get to the seven classes. So you add 56 to 115, then you add 56 to 171, and so forth, until you have the lower limits filled in in the table. Now you're going to find the upper limit, and to find the first upper limit, you're simply going to take the second lower limit and subtract one from it. So once you got the first upper limit, all you have to do now is add the class width to each upper limit to get the intervals for the classes. So here is the intervals or the classes for this example for the GPS dollars. Pause and try. So the first thing you need here is the class width. And then you're going to start with the lowest limit or the minimum value and you're going to add the class with it to get your lower limits. And your first upper limit again is going to be one less the second class's lower limit and then you can add the class with to get all the following upper limits. So the next part of constructing a frequency distribution is to start tallying the data. So what you're going to do is you're going to make tally marks for each data entry in the row of the appropriate class. So you're going to put a tally mark next to the appropriate class for each data piece. Then you're going to count those data to find the total frequency for each class. So here we go. We have the classes that we found, so the next step is now to start tallying the data. And I like to go down, so I'm going down from 90, and I'm going to put 90 in the appropriate class. 90 is between 59 and 114, so I'm going to put a tally mark there. And then I'm going to do the next one, which is 275. And 275 is in the fourth class, which is the 227 to 282. So I'm going to put a tally mark. And then the 220 is in the third class. And then I'm going down. The 130 will fall into the second class. The 270 will fall into the fourth. And the 100 will fall into the first. And I'm going to do that for each piece of data. So now I'm just going to fill it in. So I'm filling in based on the data. I'm putting all the tally marks in the appropriate row that matches the interval that the data falls into. Now that all the data is counted, I'm going to add up the tallies. And when you have a crossbar over four lines, that means that there's five data pieces. So in the first one, I end up with five. The second, I get eight. The third, I get six. The fourth, I get fifth, five. And then two, one, and three. So this is the frequency of the data that falls into each class. Now the important part here is you want to double check to see that you got every single data piece by adding up the frequency. So when you add this up, it should add up to 30 data pieces. So we added it up and it does equal 30. So I counted all the data pieces. An important piece to, the, to remember here is if you're not given a total of data pieces, but you're given a frequency distribution table, to find the total, you add up the frequency. 
The next piece is the midpoint of the class. To find the midpoint of the class, you need the lower limit plus the upper limit and divide by 2. So when you're looking for the midpoint, take the lower limit, add it to the upper limit, and divide by 2. The relative frequency or percentage of distribution is a portion or percent of the data that falls into the particular class or interval. So to find that, what you're going to do is you're going to take the frequency of the class and divide it by the sample size. And that will give you a decimal, and every decimal can be converted to a percent. So relative frequency is the percent of the data that falls into that class. So when you add the frequency, the relative frequency up, it should add up to 1, or if you had it in percent format, 100%. And then you're going to find the cumulative frequency distribution. And what the cumulative frequency is, it's the sum of the frequencies for the class and all the previous classes. So let's do this. So the first thing we're going to do here with the same example as we've been working with, the GPS example, we're going to find our midpoints. And the midpoint is the lower limit plus the upper limit. So in the first class, we're going to add 59 plus 114, and then we're going to divide it by 2, and that will be our midpoint for the class. So I get 86.5. Now, to find the next midpoints, all I have to do is add the class width to it. So I'm taking 86.5, and I'm adding 56 to each class midpoint so that I have the midpoint for each of the classes. Next, we're going to find our relative frequency. The relative frequency, again, is a percent or decimal, and we're going to use the sum or the size of the sample, and we're going to take the frequency and divide it by the sample size. So in this case, the first one we end up with 5 divided by 30, and we end up with a repeating decimal. 0.16666. So we're going to round that to 0.17. That is the relative frequency for our first class. Approximately 17% of our data falls within the first class. And we're going to find the relative frequency for each class by taking the frequency and dividing it by the number of data pieces. So we get 8 divided by 30, and we get a repeating decimal of 2.666. So we're going to round that to 2.7. And then we're going to do that all the way down the list, and we get our relative frequency. Now, a key note that I want to point out here is you cannot use the class width to find the next relative frequency because a frequency it, or the relative frequency is a percentage. So you're not adding class width to it. And then we're going to add to make sure that it adds up to 1. It should add up to 1 or 100%. And in this case, it adds up to 1.01. .01. And there is a little description discrepancy of that 0 0.01, and that is because we did some rounding in our division. So sometimes it might be slightly off, but it shouldn't be off any more than a 0 0.01. And now we do the cumulative frequency. The cumulative frequency will always start with the frequency of the first class. And then what you're going to do is you're going to take the frequency of the next class and add it to that frequency. So we have 5 plus 8, and that's going to give me the cumulative frequency for the second class. And I'm going to do that all the way down the line until I have the cumulative frequency for every single class. And at the end, the last class should have the total amount of data pieces and that is the cumulative frequency. Pause and try. This is what your answer should look like. And when you do the frequency, you should end up with 13, 21, 11, 2, and 3. The midpoints, 105, 150, 195, 240, 285 are relative frequencies. And then the cumulative frequency. The class width you should have had was 45. So summarizing and graphing data, one of the types of 
graphs that you will see in statistics is the frequency histogram. So frequency histogram is similar to the picture that you see to the right. And what it is, it's bar graph that represents the frequency distribution. The horizontal scale represents the classes of quantitative data values. So again, the horizontal is our classes or intervals. The vertical scale represents the frequency, and then the consecutive bars must touch. And in order to get the consecutive bars to touch, you will be using a class boundaries. Some important uses of histograms is it visually displays the shape of the distribution of data. It shows the location of the center of data, and it shows the spread of data, and it also identifies any outliers. The next type of graph that we will see is stem and leaf plot, but it does show the spread of the data, similar to the histogram, uh, and it also contains the original data values. Now notice here that the stem is the first value in the data, or it could be the first two values if it's in the hundreds, and the leaf is always the end value of the data. So you see here with the 26, the leaf is, or the stem is the, 20, the 2, and the 6 is the leaf. So this is also going to display the shape of distribution for the data. The next one is the dot plot. Each data entry is plotted using a point above the horizontal axis. So on the horizontal axis, you're going to have all the data numbers in numerical order, and then what you'll do is you'll put a point above the data set. This also will display a shape of distribution. And the next also is used commonly in statistics for businesses, the way of seeing a trend. This is the time series graph. So it's a graph of time series which are quantitative data that have been collected at different points in time, such as like a monthly or yearly. So you see here in this graph, we're doing yearly, and you can see the difference between law enforcement fatalities from 1985 to 2010 and beyond. So it reveals information about the trends over time. And then lastly, we have this pie chart, and the pie chart shows the distribution of categorical data in a commonly used format. So in this particular case, we're looking at a pie chart of sto stolen boats, and you can kind of see, based on the piece of pie, which are more commonly stolen than others.